celebrating nine years of podcast excellence. The King of Podcasts Radio Network proudly presents the Wrestling Is Real Podcast because wrestling needs us. Welcome to episode number 700 of the Wrestling Is Real Podcast. The show's been on now almost nine and a half years here podcasting for all of you and actually through king of podcasts.com and then i changed to the website the wrestling is real.com and it's amazing what has culminated in all this time when we know the impact wrestling was tna back in the day and WWE was right in the middle of a lot of bad morale anyway we're now back to that again because it just keeps coming back in spurts and it's really amazing how much growth that the wrestling space has had because remember we had the returns of mlw we have the nwa and the turnaround from tna into the transition from impact wrestling as a re- as a wrestling show into the entire name of the promotion altogether and then you have other promotions out there the rise of gcw and it's really wonderful to see all this. And also just the way that New Japan Pro Wrestling became such an important part of where things are, which also culminates with Forbidden Door this weekend. I'll talk about that here on the program. And we're also going to do a post show, of course, for that Forbidden Door pay-per-view. Go, of course, catch it right here, wrestlingisrael.com. Please make sure to rate and review. Because there's not been, you would think after all these episodes that maybe there will be some reviews up there, but there are not. And it's unfortunate. And I would really love if some people out there could do that for me and just really give some comments out there. Hopefully they're good reviews. And just rate for me. So this this show gets a little more boost, a little more enthusiasm. I know some of you have actually kept uh, this show on and you've really enjoyed it. And I appreciate all of you for being P1s and being on this show since the beginning. Ice Paint 23, of course. I always get the shout out. My previous co-hosts, which it was Marky Mark 11 or Jeremy G., or Xbox One Chuck, who I no longer talk to, but that's it is what it is. And among the other people that were on this program that have really been out there, Ghost Noble, you know, all of you out there, hey, I appreciate all of you that have stuck around this whole time and still find this show. And wherever you are around the world that you've listened to the show, I'm so thankful. And I'm so grateful that you catch this show because I've wanted to be making this show like nobody else. And, you know, I don't want to do a show like my fellow podcast brethren. I don't want to do a show where I'm such a fanboy that I'm looking to try to go ahead and make extra money or try to get, you know, the play cating of a fan. I want want to be a fan that gets closer to the stars. It doesn't matter to me, right? I go to the shows when I like to go when they're in town and I, I feel like paying for it. And the same thing goes if I want to go ahead and enjoy on television. It's been my thing. Like, I don't quote this match at this pay-per-view or this event at this thing. I don't do any of that. I just enjoy wrestling and everybody else. But I watch the programming intently. And I always have it on. When I think about it, the amount of television I watch now. Like, before it was, what, just an hour in Impact and then four hours of Raw and SmackDown? I forget if the Raw went to three hours by that point or not. I think it might have been by the time I got to recording this show. But I've done this for a long time. And I really feel like I've gotten very good at at learning how to do this show. The funny thing is, too, for the most part of these 700 episodes, I have sat in the same place. Now, the chair has changed. The microphone has definitely changed a few times. The laptop has changed a few times. But... What I have now is a pretty good setup. And when I thought at one point, I thought I would always need a co-host and I just got point to getting used to doing the monologue and getting really comfortable to just go at an hour and not feel like to do two hours. Like I feel like the evolution of just doing this program and now this format I've had here for a number of years has been so wonderful and I've really enjoyed it. And there's just quite a bit I get to talk about. And I've gotten to the point where my podcasting alone, for the most part, is all by myself. I don't worry about anybody else. I don't worry about some production team or other people helping out. And 
Most importantly, I want good content. I don't want to waste your time. I want to make sure I sound good for you so that you're not complaining or you're feeling like, well, I can't listen to this guy. I can't listen to what he's saying. And I don't want to be fumbling around my words either. I want to be pretty concise. I want to have an opinion that is well detailed and researched and, you know, pretty good educational guess on a lot of things. And maybe there's some things I might have as opinions that other pop my other my podcast wrestling brother might have as well, and that's okay. But I'm also not going to come on here to do clickbait. I'm not going to do with the Wall Street Journal last week with, with this McMahon, which is what I want to talk about right now. The Wall Street Journal, if I'm correct, okay, and mark me if I'm wrong, they only reported once on Wednesday. Have they done anything about the the WWE since then? Have they done any follow-up reporting on that? Has there been anything? I'm looking right now. Can anybody tell me if they did? No. As far as I know, I don't think they have. I'm going to look and see if there's any other news that have been done at this moment, but it doesn't look like they have. If I just do a search for WWE right now and see what happens, and so let me see if anything pops up. Well, at the moment, they have a podcast called The Journal, right? And that's it. They've only done one story, and they did a podcast about it. They have done no follow-ups on this report. Am I looking for anything else? Well, they did another report talking about the McMahon stepping aside or stepping back, which everybody decided to go a step down. Everybody said that. And we don't have anything else that's being said at all about it. Like, it's just consistently, let's say, step down. And everybody follows it. And everybody out there, like, I'm really surprised that every, I think Brandon Thurst is one of the few guys that at least wanted to at least, you know, try to read into the story more. We're not going to appreciate what he's doing. And he's putting his neck out there because he's got quite of a profile when I don't. But yeah, it's like as if you can't even comment on the fact that someone like me with a low profile, because I know I'm not that big, but I've been around long enough that, you know, I'm, I got some respect in the game. But I know that when I read this story last week, and I really read it immediately after, and I gave my commentary, and I was thinking, should I have gone on and talked more about it? Well, I did a little bit on the post show for Simiverse. You can go ahead and catch it right now, com. When I look back at the story, the one thing I guess that's being said is that everybody is quantifying what the story said. So the investigation is real. I never disputed that part. I never disputed that the lawyers were involved because I think if the lawyers are coming in and they're being added to the mix, it's just whatever was being going on of the emails and this paralegal that is of question, everybody is if true, if true, if true. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. See, I went to school for journalism. And I never learned anything about just going along with half-truths or something that is not confirmed. I like confirmed sources. I like confirmed reports. But we can't get any confirmation here at all. But instead, all the other media sources say they will quote the Wall Street Journal like it is fact. Because it's not the reporting that is quantified. It's the fact that it came from the Wall Street Journal. Because if the Wall Street Journal says it, it is gospel. It's Old Testament. I don't do that anymore because I know that the trust in media, according to the latest Pew Research Center report, is 28%. People don't trust the media anymore. And especially with stories like this. Are you telling me you don't think this is, could have been a, a spot of cancel culture? It could have been. I think it is. But you know what Vince McMahon has been doing? He's been trolling. If anybody thought he was going to go on to SmackDown on Friday night or surprisingly come on to raw monday night and do anything or say anything about the allegations no you know what he has right now he has less time to worry about being ceo because he has to be out of the office physically more or less and he gets to go ahead and work the shows like he's been doing anyway and so stephanie takes over for him for the most part as the interim just as a facilitator 
until this investigation, which I guess won't take more than a month. And then it'll be back in, in the office once again. And no one will even remember. It will just be a smear against Vince McMahon. Now, I am not going to say anything. And I still don't say anything about, you know, the morale of this man. We know this guy's done some impropri- improprietous things in the past. And I don't, I wouldn't doubt at all if he did have a consensual relationship or did have some kind of relationship that was out of bounds, according to corporate policy, that would look, be looked down upon by the stockholders and by the general public. But this Wall Street Journal was put out so that the court of public opinion, and mostly not just public opinion, wrestling fans, wrestling fans who live in their bubbles because they want to be able to say Vince is going to get fired and we're going to get a change and then WWE is going to be what we wanted to be. And you know what people got happy about? Oh, Triple H is back at a performance center. We don't know what's going on with that either. Okay. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. John Paul, I appreciate him reporting that. See, he's actually doing reporting and actually getting facts. Right. When Brandon Thurston does his stuff for WrestleNomics, listen, post-wrestling, all those things that they're doing over there, they do a really good job, and they're actually reporting pretty solid. In some cases, Dave Meltzer does break a few, quite a few things. Brian Alfred as well, Wrestling Observer Newsletter. That's why I talk about him a lot. And Fightful gets quite a few things right. Like, they're actually digging, and they're actually learning, and they'll get people on the ground that will actually find out things. But then there's the part where I hear Dave Meltzer, and they'll put out a free clip on the uh, Observer's YouTube channel for 30 minutes and go through the whole allegations. We get, the, like, the nuggets of, of actually what was said. But it's like, where's Dave Meltzer disputing and trying to fact check, fact check all this? Nobody wants to fact check Wall Street Journal. Oh, God forbid this government, this, this large run newspaper of 150 some odd years. We can't say anything bad about them. Why not? Who are they to not be criticized? They're in the same vein as everybody else. So I am going to worry more about what's going on here than anything else about the credibility of the Wall Street Journal. Okay, now everybody is going to go along with the story. It's been a week. I don't think we've heard anything else in terms of if anybody's going to go after Vince McMahon about this, but I guess the investigation is going to go ahead and pan out, and that's it. So maybe what's happening right now is Vince McMahon and team at WWE is just They're going through the motions. They're taking proper protocol in a situation like this. They're letting their independent board of directors, the side of the board of directors on the independent side, they're going to be the ones that are going to be involved in this, not the ones that are involved in the day-to-day operations. So they're going to leave it as an open investigation as much as they can, a third party of attorneys that will come in to work on this, and WWE is going to give complete transparency as much as they can. And that's it. So people are going to keep talking about this, and this man is just going to say, and what? That is what he did. He didn't say anything in particular at SmackDown. He didn't say anything in particular except for the announcement that John Cena is going to celebrate 20 years at Laredo, Texas next week on Raw. Okay. That just means ratings, because then both shows broke 2 million viewers. And you know what happens next week? They're going to break 2 million viewers, both shows. That's called turning bad publicity into good publicity. This big man doesn't even give a shit about the allegations. And we don't know anything. Listen, and if you're going to believe what Wall Street Journal says, I have <laughs> I have the Royal Ponytana Bridge in Palm Beach. I got you to sell it for like a buck. How about that? I'll sell it to you right now. Because I'm not going to go ahead and quantify. I'm not going to validate the Wall Street Journal just because they put out that story. Those two reporters, political reporters have you. But I am also not going to exonerate Vince McMahon or John Laurinaitis, for that matter, who has also stepped aside from his duties. And now Bruce Pritchard apparently is now head of talent uh, talent relations for the time being. So they've made their shuffle. All right. And I imagine that Triple H is now at NXT because that kind of takes wherever Vince is going on. Because I guess Vince has to be made available and can't be going to Orlando regularly. He probably has to go ahead and make himself available for the investigation. Otherwise, what else is going on here? So I'm not going to worry about that too much. 
I'm not going to be like everyone else that are going to go for this story and completely take it on it on on its uh, face value. I can't do that. I've been I've studied to be a journalist. I understand what it meant to be to have like that shield of journalistic integrity. Like it's not any kind of an oath or anything like that, but there is something to be said about being a credible journalist. And for someone that's going to be an investigative journalist, how much time do you think it took the Wall Street Journal writers to write the story and put it together? Took a few phone calls. They already had the story kind of like put together. And what they said it was since January, they were going through this investigation, this whole kind of fact finding of which somebody else was doing and gave it to them on a silver platter, right? This is where the story was given to them. They took a few phone calls. They did the right thing. Supposedly air quotes. Offering a WWE spokesperson to talk about these allegations before they went to print, which they gave no time to go ahead and probably give any real solid comments. And then they went to Jerry McDevitt to get his comments because they know they better go out to him because, for the record, if they get slapped for a defamation lawsuit, they better have talked to Jerry McDevitt. And that's it. So take the whole story with Vince McMahon as you want, but he's turned into a positive. New York Post, I'm going to go to a different publication. And Joseph Stasiewski writes about professional wrestling. It's weekly column, the post-match angle. He wrote about this. That McMahon was announced early in the day on Friday he would appear on SmackDown, which got 2.29 million viewers. McMahon came out to the crowd, not a care in the world, because I guess the TV character isn't being investigated. Vince McMahon is. There were some boos, but he was loudly cheered at moments, and WWE camera, the cameras would cut, of course, to clapping audience members. No remorse, no apology, nope. And then he also made an appearance on Monday Night Raw for a pointless segment to basically remind the audience about John Cena returning to the show next week, announced weeks ago, and the company's run endless TV promos for it. And this is what Staskiewski says here. It just appears that McMahon is doing it because he can at this point. It's all away from the show. I'm here. I don't plan on going anywhere. And I dare the board to try to get rid of me because he can't because they all have the he has the most powerful voting shares. And has more than enough control to never be removed from his position unless an absolutely critical situation. Also, it's a show to way, show, it was a way to show that it is business as usual in WWE. And McMahon is hoping the audience accepts that they do most everything else as he provides it for him on TV. It doesn't benefit McMahon for people to look past the headline and question the bare minimum way he and the company have treated this so far. Fightful Select and PW Insider both reported that talent were informed Monday night that Bruce Pritchard is now interim head of talent relations. Lauren Idis, who hasn't been at a WWE event since the allegations, was placed on administrative leave, and there was no clarification on his current job status when the post requested prior to Monday's Monday Night Raw. He goes on to say that you would think, given the seriousness of what McMahon and Lauren Idis are accused of, and the fact we haven't gotten a public denial from either, we still don't have that a week later. That more action would have been taken by WWE. But that's because I think there's nothing more serious to this. This is a hit piece. It was calculated. It was scheduled. They could have dropped it at any time. Any time. Ble- McMahon has already pledged complete co- co- cooperation, we know. We know that Stephanie is now interim CEO. Nothing to see here because McMahon can't afford to lose the audience or confidence in company stock, which has been trending upward to the report and took a small hit. So even now, if you look at the stock market price, it hasn't taken much of a hit at all. I haven't checked what it is today, but let me just check real quick what they have so far. Well, I mean, still remember the market's completely down bad anyway, but if I look at the five day average, yeah, it's taken some hit but not even close to what it could have been. Like, it's not going horribly bad. It was at 65 
on June 15th, which is a week ago, it went up to 68 at the highest, and now it's down at 60. So the past five days, it's gone down 7%. So I go back a month, that's even not much different than what it was a month ago. Because a month ago, May 23rd, it was a 61. So whatever gains that might have been done, it's like not much difference anyway. And if I even go back six months, they're still way ahead in the last six months, up 24%. That's just how it is. So if the Wall Street Journal story was done for ulterior motives, then they got the stock to take a small hit, but it's not much else. And as I said, it's still more or less business as usual. Like they have other bigger problems they're going to worry about. And that's the whole thing they got at the moment is that they have other issues to worry about. I mean, the WWE, what, investigation? What are you talking to me about? Let's get into something more important. Like the fact that they don't have anybody available. They're in the, in the, in the situation where they've been many times before, right? When you look back at how many times this company has gone through issues where they are stuck, right? When they get stuck on trying to work themselves around all the issues of trying to take care of various issues with injuries. Like how many times we talk about injuries all the time on this program and how they constantly go through the same issue over and over. I can go back many times. As we know right now, we're having this current issue. But if I go back, we know that the main event setbacks have always happened. It actually happens in 2020. Remember when we lost Carry On Cross when it came to NXT and the fact that we were going to hope that maybe down the line he was going to be looked at as somebody important? And there's a lot of times where they thought there were potential stars that could have made something really big of themselves. 2018, we had Jason Jordan get his neck injury, and they were putting a big push behind him, remember? And then you had 2016, where SummerSlam had a lot of issues, where Finn Balor, Samoa Joe, and Sasha Banks were all, they all had injuries, and they were all losing their respective saddle belts. Among other things. But that's just going back the last five, six years. But this is normal for this company to go through. And so Bleacher Report actually put out a good story that really did bring up all of that. But actually, before I run into that, was one of the story I wanted to see if they had anything more that was being said about this McMahon and the investigation, new details. Because, by the way, besides the fact that Vince McMahon stepped aside and a couple of different things were shuffled, you can't find anything else being talked about this. This story lost legs. By the weekend, nothing else happened with this story. This, this story did not even last past the weekend news cycle. If they were going to try to really go after attack and put the tiki torches up on this big man, they ran out. One story, one and done. It's up to the wrestling publications to carry this story now. And I think the Wall Street Journal probably knew that. So we do know that five law firms are currently looking to take a class action lawsuit against the WWE on behalf of its investors. And Brandon Thurston, to his credit, is the one that's actually been doing good work at actually putting that all together. And there were five press releases that he posted on Twitter of what was being said. And there's been nothing else since. I wanted to just make sure. And this is from an iHeart radio station website that talked about it. And that's it. We didn't have anything else that was being brought up at all. That's why, when I just wanted to go back and look if there would be some follow-up. Normally, you would have follow-up after that. There was nothing. Like, I really feel like this is a non-story. I know some people are going to take this so seriously because, you know, I, I do believe wrestling fans sometimes forget what real life is because we're always stuck in this world of fantasy and this whole storytelling and how things are in the WWE universe and how we can't really 
separate fiction from reality. I understand that part. I don't blame them. I don't blame the fan cast out there that are doing the same thing. Or they're doing it on purpose because they know it causes clicks. It gets people to go and listen, to, uh, watch their YouTube channels and their commercials every five minutes because they on purpose set the commercials at full load if you're watching their show. Plus, they make sure not to even edit the show down for you. They just leave it fully raw. So you have to go and scroll through. And for the fact that there are tens of thousands of people that will do that on a regular basis, it tells you something. Wrestling fans have patience and they believe a lot. And they can be had, just like anybody else. So anyway, I was going to talk about, like I said, Bleacher Report. And the injuries and the creative bankruptcy, they call it. Forcing WWE to go back to other part-timers, as they always do. So, no Randy Orton. No Cody Rhodes for the summer. So let's replace with Brock Lesnar and John Cena. So... We know Brock Lesnar returned on SmackDown, and he'll face Roman Reigns at SummerSlam in a last man standing match on July 30th for the undisputed WWE Universal Championship. And then John Cena will celebrate two decades with the company, Monday Night on Raw, and will be part of a jumpstarting a program that will culminate at Slimmer Sam as well. So they expect those to be major, major matches they'll have. I'm not surprised. And when they're in the, they're, and at the moment that they're in, they have no choice but to go forward with this, right? And even Eric Beast in the Bleach Report says, none of this should be surprising the fans familiar with the product over the last decade. What will this most recent run have in store for the returning icons and the fans who tune into the company's television programming? Well, they actually go back pretty comprehensively. 2011. We know that WWE was not the career-making, star-making machine it was in previous years. But I've talked about that on previous episodes. You know, I have. If I can go back really quickly and tell you where I talked about it, I will do that for you right now. I go back to episode 630, back in August of last year. I talked about how... WWE creatively controls the pipeline to the Hollywood vacuum because they have all their stars that are being made so big because when they do make stars, they make superstars and not just superstars that stay within the realm of the WWE universe. They go out to Hollywood. As we know right now, Roman Reigns most likely is being looked at right now with his agency with agents in tow, trying to get him some movie deals or some projects we can work on. We know that Sasha Banks, right now we have a bit of an issue because of the fact that she's been exposed to Hollywood so much. I mean, she's getting a lot of appearances. She was on Mandalorian. And there's a lot being said about her to really pay attention. So you got that to worry about. Batista, we know, been long gone. He did at least make an appearance not too long ago to take on Triple H, which was nice. And The Rock... Maybe he will come back at some point to want one more match, hopefully. But we don't know what he's going to have in store for him yet. But there's a whole lot going on. And John Cena has been so much entrenched into Hollywood. I'm surprised he's able to make it back as well. But there's so many stars, you know, and I'm surprised Becky Lynch has not gone back out there yet. Because she, because at one point she was being looked at, but motherhood called first. And we don't know other stars that could be looked at down the line. Listen, Cody Rhodes is already getting a little bit of exposure because of what he was doing in AEW. And when he comes back, what could happen? Seth Rollins could almost get to that point, too. But not every WWE superstar is going to be like Randy Orton and be a full lifer or like an edge that will come back and work again and again, which is what Vince McMahon wants. But that's not what he's going to get because of what's going on right now. And this is why in 2011 they stopped doing that. Because of what happened. When you look at what's going on with the stars that were starting to be made pretty popular, you know, when you start seeing the likes of, I mean, there wasn't so much where you had any kind of route to the point where all these stars had some of their places to go. Because remember, the other thing, too, that they didn't have the deal with back in 2011 was there wasn't any real competition of what of what people could go after, right? I mean, 
a lot of older stars, the same Bischoff Hogan thing that was happening before in, in WCW happened again. And then when TNA decided to let's go ahead and pick up Kurt Angle and Booker T and Mick Foley and Ric Flair and all these other stars, same thing as before. And in and the Hardys, and didn't pan out anywhere else for them either. It got a little bit of a bump, and Vince Bruce they brought into the mix, and like, okay, whatever. But you didn't have anybody that was out there that was going to be really doing much, if anything. In 2011, the company looked at The Rock to do a two-year program with John Cena. Undertaker and Triple H popped up on TV to hype major pay-per-view matches. Kevin Nash made his presence felt in a desperate attempt by the company to bolster his young roster with marquee names. Then a year later, Lesnar would return to the company, and then the part-time performer playbook was formed. Helped to sell pay-per-views rather than taking the time to create new stars and run atop the car for the future. The retirements of Undertaker and Triple H and a return of Hollywood for The Rock ensured that subsided somewhat. Lesnar would continue to pop up from time to time. And then we know that Ronda Rousey has been that same vein. But now we already see she's kind of been normalized in WWE. So like it really that, that special feeling of Ronda Rousey being in the company is not there anymore, especially not the second time around. She feels like she's a WWE superstar of a status, but I don't think she's getting the kind of level of press and publicity that she was getting before. And since 2011, we know that John Cena, you know, there was a point where WWE was trying to go and create their own platforms to be able to control what was being done. So that's what you had all those movies going on by the studios, right? And they tried to do something like that. So in the story, they go on and say that it makes sense that an entertainment company would recruit its most recognizable stars to help sell a major production. They recognize the need for all an attraction and call on the heavy hitters for the most prestigious extravaganzas. But they can't keep this up, is what they're saying in this Bleach Report article. They can't keep that up. It's not possible. And then you really want to know how desperate they become. Well, look at every time they have to go to Saudi Arabia. The Saudi princes ask for so much. They have to pull back out Goldberg. They have to pull back out Lesnar. I mean, all this. And do you realize right now that John Cena, he has, he's coming back. He's going to be 45 years old. And so there's great to see him back here. But even we know that at some point, we're not going to be completely at a point where John Cena is going to be able to get pulled the kind of matches he did before. He's going to be rusty coming back. I mean, to expect him to have the same level of performance he's always had, that's going to be asking a lot of him. Because, I mean, he is getting older. I mean, he's 45. He's not going to move around as much as like he did before. I'm going to be surprised how well he'll move around the ring this time around. Plus, what he's going to be able to do, because he has to make sure he keeps himself healthy, because he can't, get him, keep, can't be getting himself injured if he has other projects in the queue. So now there's a thought that uh, that theory might be the next person that's going to confront John Cena, and that's where we're going to go with things with theory. Because theory is one of the breakout stars in the company, and he took to his Twitter account in connection with a recently released photo shoot to taunt Cena. And what he did was, is he dressed up like John Cena. He wore the Thugonomics chain, he wore the United States Championship, and he was showing himself with a different with a spinner belt. Like he did all that simply the taunt, which will be shown later. And look, there he's working well, man. It's not bad. He's a 24 year old. And he being put up against the biggest star the company's ever produced in the Attitude Era would be a great move. And that will help a lot. And they did give Theory a pretty good high-profile spot with him up against Pat McAfee, and that worked out all right. So don't get me wrong. There are stars being made. I will continue to say over and over, 
Bianca Belair is is a shining light right now. She is shining right now. And I'm actually happy that they don't put her and the Street Profits very much together as much. And listen, not against Montez Ford. He's lucky to be. I'm going to just say it. Montez, buddy, you're in her shadow. <laughs> you're never going to get to her level. But we already knew that she was going to be the star. The Street Profits were not going to be anywhere at the level that Bianca Belair is right now. She is everything. Everything you could want in a WWE superstar. And her promos have gotten better. Her presence is a lot better. She just, I mean, she's just great to see in the ring, on camera. She's likable. And I don't think you change her to a heel anytime soon. I don't think you do anything like that now. I really feel like at these days, I know she could play a good heel. I think she plays babyface for a long time. I don't think you even change her right now. Because I feel like she's going to be a role model to so many young girls out there. I mean, talk about the success story of, you know, well, I mean, she's been successful in so many different places where she's gone in life anyway, from her track and field work to here now. And talk about an ambassador to the company, a spokesperson. Like, that's, you can't, in the women's division, you can't ask for better. You just wish you had more Bianca Belair's out there. And now Rhea Ripley's kind of gotten hurt. And they're putting her in a good spot with Judgment Day. But now she's got a brain injury, it looks like. And so there's some serious issues there about what will happen with her and where things are going to go next. But at the moment, we don't see where any stars right now. There are there are no other stars that can help to boost up younger stars. Now, don't get me wrong. I still think WWE has been doing a good job of trying to build other stars anyway. They've been trying. I really believe that. And you see that especially on the Raw side. I mean, you could say Riddick, uh, Riddick Moss as Mad Cat Moss. You could say that with him and Happy Corbin to a point. And you could say there's the same thing right now with Raquel Rodriguez pairing up with Ronda Rousey in a match. You could say that. But there are not a lot of new stars they're looking to bring up. But remember, we know why. Because they have changed course with the kind of stars they're bringing into NXT. We haven't talked about that. And their numbers have been okay. The NXT numbers for 2.0 have been over 600,000 pretty consistently. So they're not hurting right now. The change that they made to let go of all those other stars they had that were in NXT for a long time that, that Triple H did bring up, that taking the indie wrestlers and polishing them up did not work, and not many of them made it through into the main roster. And I'm sure there are some there are some of my fellow podcasting brethren that absolutely think, well, those stars would make it so such a big deal if if Adam Cole were here, or if Colorado were here, or if you know whatever, pick a name, if Andrade were still here, if Malachi Black were still here. Well, they did get chances. Did they get great chances? Maybe not, but they did get chances. And have all those stars made that much of a difference over in AEW? Well, we don't know because AEW has continuously changed up who they have. They brought in so many names. And to kind of keep up with any certain stars that are at a certain level, you know, they are working on trying to give people airtime. And a time where they have so many stars on the roster, so much great talent, but they don't worry so much about making sure that talent has to be on there every week, like the WWE does. Because the other companies themselves don't do that either. All the other wrestling companies, well, you know what? Except for the exception of Impact, Impact does continue to keep certain stars out there all the time. They're the only ones. But every other wrestling promotion on TV, MLW, NWA, they don't, as far as I know, and as far as I've seen. But when you look at what they're doing right now with Raw, look, they've given Liv Morgan chances to be in there, and they put her in the five-way match. And then Omos has also been out there. Now, we don't talk much about Riddle, but Riddle actually has been quite well up in the mix. They did have him lose to Omos. But now we know that Riddle and Seth Rollins are going to have a program, which is a good move. Seth Rollins working with Ron, with Riddle will be good. I believe that's actually going to work out pretty well. So if you have those matches coming up to Money in the Bank, or going after Money in the Bank and you're going to SummerSlam with that, 
where you have Reigns, Lesnar, Theory, and Cena, and Reigns and, and Rollins and Riddle, that's not bad. At least you got a couple of younger stars in the mix you're trying to bring up there. We know Bianca will have a title match. We know that uh, Ronda will have a title match. That'll build up that card okay. That's that's going to be okay. They're going to find their way through. Right now, Bobby Lashley's dealing with Theory. We have that going on. And, you know, yeah, we could go ahead and say that the whole pose down thing was not anything special, but they're working off of it. It's a way to kind of work something there. And then that's for the most part. You're only going hand, to hand, have a handful of stars they are going to really believe in that are going to go a far way up. But we don't know what they're going to do. Overall, I understand all the uh, fans out there and what they're going to say on their gripes. But this also happens every time they have injuries. I mean, Randy Orton was going to be in some match, and everybody was going to probably complain about what they would have to do with him, obviously. And with Cody Rhodes, you know, being that fresh face that was into the mix, that would be somebody that was definitely going to be brought up. Listen, they did the right thing by Cody that eventually we'll see him next year after the pectoral injury heals and he's able to recover and recuperate that I think he's going to be a pretty big star coming back. Right now, they just have to get past SummerSlam and then coast past the rest of the year up to day one. Because you know that's what they're going to do. Are they going to make much difference about when it comes to Survivor Series? No. <laughs> they never do. So they just need to get back, get past Summer Sam season, and they can continue to start building up other stars. Like, they need the part-timers now to go and take care of things here. They also need to go and take care of things when it comes to the show in England that's coming up, and they need to cover for Crown Jewel. If they're able to get past those three shows, they're going to come out of it with roses. They'll be fine. Brock will work those shows. Roman will work with those shows. Ronda will work those shows. And maybe John Cena will work those shows. And that's about it. So if they're able to go and cover through those couple of months like that, that covers the rest of your year, and they're just fine. Meanwhile, AEW has a different direction. So I feel like AEW right now is doing what Ring of Honor did with the New Japan Supercard. They're at that level now. And I don't know, but I mean, the opportunity presented itself for them to go and do what they're going to do at Forbidden Door anyway, which is good. But we know, just like the Supercard, sure, there's going to be some matches that will have some real implications. But with New Japan, just like the Ring of Honor shows when they had New Japan Town, my curiosity is going to be what will happen if they decide to go ahead and put these stars together, will it have to be a point where certain New Japan stars cannot be beaten? Like, what's the booking going to look like? I mean, what's the chance we're going to see certain stars come out with something here? Now, it's all AEW titles that are on the line, except for the New Japan belt, the world title. That is on the line. Oh, and the Ring of Honor, it's going to be the IWGP tag team titles. So those two titles are being brought into the Forbidden Door pay-per-view, which is nice. But other than that, you're talking about four title matches they have scheduled with a bunch of other things are going to be going on. And they have a couple of matches that will include New Japan stars that could come away as champions. But are there going to be working shows after this? So the question will be in the, in the interim AW World title match, it's Tanahashi, if he were to win that title, is he going to be coming back to go and defend that belt regularly on TV after that? Or is it just pretty obvious that John Moxley is supposed to win this, and then he will take on CM Punk once the time presents itself? And CM Punk's able to come back and compete, and they can actually have a unification match. Now, as for the All Atlantic Championship for AEW, it's pretty safe to say that Tomohiro Ishii will not be the person that will probably win that belt. I mean, I don't, I have nothing against him. I just don't think that's somebody they're going to put into regularly having. I mean, he did it win championships in Ring of Honor. I forget if he won the. He did win the TV title. That's right. 
But other than that, I mean, I can see where it's either Pac or Miro. We know that Malachi Black won tonight over Penta Oscuro, so he is now set completing the Fatal 4-Way coming up for the All-Atlantic Championship. That's being brought on. That's Pac, Miro, Stone Pitbull, Tomohiro Ishii, and Malachi Black. Women's World Title Thunder Rose versus Tony Storm. They've set that up. And Tony Storm is coming on a real good momentum right now. She's, she's got really good momentum leading into that match. Orange Cassidy versus Wall Ospreay. That's that's just I mean, it's a lot of curiosity on how that match will go. Because with Orange Cassidy being brought into this whole New Japan mix, being part of Chaos, like there's something about that character and what he's doing right now to be a part of that New Japan mix. Because of what New Japan does to some of these stars from America and what it really does for them and the credibility and what, what their expectations are. Because when you look at what happened to Juice Robinson when he went over there, or when you look at Ace Austin recently going over there, and how you look at these stars differently now because they got that New Japan rub. They got to work New Japan. They got to work in Japan. That's always something very credible and very much like it's, you know, it's a it's a badge of honor. When you think about the stars that went over to Japan, I mean, think of the Bruiser Brodies or the Stan Hansons, right? Along with the current crop of stars when it comes to Moxley or Jericho. And the fact that, you know, when you see Brian Daniels in, if he ever gets himself back, whenever he gets himself back, he wants to go ahead and go after, you know, the, he wants to go into that New Japan mix and go ahead and start, you know, locking up with some of those stars over there. Trios match, Chris Jericho, Sammy Guevara, Minoru Suzuki, Eddie Kingston, Will Yudo and Shota Umino. That's a trios match by the, right there. That's a fun match. And then a winner to take all for the IWGP and Ring of Honor World Tag Team titles. What a match. FTR, Rapongi Vice, Jeff Cobb, and Great Ocon, part of Global Empire, Will Ospreay's faction. And, I mean, do you see where Global Empire could dominate the night? Because I could see Will Ospreay winning. And I could also see, maybe not so much... I mean, I could see Rapongi Vice winning and see them go back over to New Japan once again, but I don't know. Or I could see Jeff Connor, Jeff Cobb or Great O'Conn, but I think what's going to happen is I think FTR is going to collect all the gold. And so I think we're going to see FTR get to go to Japan and defend the IWGP tag team titles. Because as we say, man, FTR, one of the best tag teams in the world right now, bar none. So I think that's what happens there is Will Osprey will get the win on Orange Cassidy, and I think that FTR will collect all the gold in that multiple tag team title match. When it comes to the All-Atlantic title, I think Miro will be the first All-Atlantic champion, just like he was one of the first TNT champions. And I think Moxie will beat Tanahashi. I don't see where they're going to have Moxley dropped the belt, and then Tanahashi is going to go. I just don't know what they're going to do with that. I think Moxley is going to be the one that will be brought up against CM Punk, and we'll have a great match with those two coming up. That's where I think things go. So we're going to wrap things up. We're going to talk about Money in the Bank real quick as what they already have so far scheduled for that pay-per-view coming up the following week. So we'll talk about that for a second. The match is so far scheduled. Raw Women's title, Bianca Belair versus Carmella. And Carmella getting the win in a Fatal Five way. So take that as it is. It's something that they did for the show on Raw to give a reason for people to watch. And they started off the night with that, which was, okay, that made sense. I mean, at least with Raw and SmackDown, you're starting to see some matches that had a little more implications, more stipulations. Not so much all these championship contenders matches. All this stuff that was kind of very blunt, bland and boring. Like, it's still not great, but it's better than it has been. Smack the women's title, Ronda Rousey versus Natalia. But what they need to do in this match is they need to bring up the fact that Natalia helped to train Ronda Rousey into the wrestling world. Because nobody's talking about that. But we need to have that story told. I hope they do that on Friday because they haven't really taken much time to talk about it. And the fact that Natalia and Ronda Rousey were fast friends when they first, when Ronda first came in. They haven't discussed that. I hope they do something with that. 
U.S. title theory versus Bobby Lashley. They'll set up for that. They've done taken a lot of time for it. And, you know, I don't see where Theory's going to drop the belt. I just wonder how they're going to get him to win over Lashley. That's what I want to find out. The undisputed tag team titles, they're actually going to put those on the line. Usos against Street Profits. And then you have the two Money to Make ladder matches. Lacey Evans, Alexa Bliss, Liv Morgan, Raquel Rodriguez, and Asuka have already qualified so far. We don't know who the qualifiers are going to be for that last spot. But I imagine Becky Lynch has to be the one in that match somewhere, somehow. I don't know what they do with that, but they've already run Raw. I mean, they have time. Like, by Monday night, they probably could have a match where Becky Lynch has to win her way in some way, somehow. Like, that's going to be something they have to do here. And the Money in the Bank ladder match for the men, you got Seth Rollins, Sheamus, Drew McIntyre, Omos. And if that's it, they got to have probably two more names. And I don't know who that's going to be yet. I'd imagine, you know, and then when you look at the inside track of who should be winning these Money in the Bank ladder matches, who should be getting the briefcases? I can understand where Lacey Evans gets the argument, and I can see where Liv Morgan gets the argument. I think they could probably do something like that. They don't usually have a problem having a face win that briefcase. On the men's side, I could definitely see Seth Rollins winning it again. And that would be good for him to go ahead and take that belt back off of Roman Reigns, if that's the case. And that storyline already tells itself. Drew McIntyre winning it could also be the option. But I don't know who you're going to have left that's going to go into that Money in the Bank ladder match on the men's side. Don't have any clue about it. So we'll find out. So we know that Forbidden Door is coming up this weekend. We'll have that coming up right here. WrestleGoesReal.com. Come back for that. I'll keep it short tonight. I made all my points. I've covered everything I wanted to cover. So thank you for listening in. Thank you for being here for episode number 700 of the Wrestling Girls Podcast. I really appreciate all of you being here. I hope you'll continue the ride with me because the next big milestone is the 10th anniversary coming up. And if I'm correct, let me look at this calendar right now. I'll tell you right now when that's supposed to be. It would most likely be, if I do it, I guess it would have to be the 21st of December. I actually started the show on December 18th of 2012, but I will go ahead and celebrate it because Sunday is that week. I will go ahead and celebrate it on the 21st of December right here, rescuesworld.com. So look for that. That's coming up the 10th anniversary of this program. In the meantime, we'll finish 700. 701 will be the Forbidden Door post show. Enjoy Forbidden Door this weekend, folks. Come back for another Wrestling Control podcast because wrestling needs us. Thank you for listening to the Wrestling Is Real podcast. You can find all previous episodes at WrestlingIsReal.com or subscribe to the show on all major podcast outlets, including Apple, Amazon, Google, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Follow the King of Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at King of Podcasts. And search King of Podcasts on YouTube or type youtube.com slash jbrasco951. This has been a presentation of the King of Podcasts Radio Network. 